perhaps not so much important, but um, I try to make some traces today and to, to give you some insights uh, about the current development of museums architecture. And I would like to thank Randert and Niels Lewis here in particular for the very kind invitation and uh, to make my, stable, uh, my stay here as comfortable as possible. So, ladies and gentlemen, the globalization paradigm in museums architecture, and you see uh, just a 10-year-old um, Paul Klee Center in Bern by Renzo Piano, which is one of the also interesting globalized museum figures, Renzo Piano. The museum is claimed to be the new cathedral of our age. It has become one of the most esteemed and sophisticated commissions to be awarded, even though it does not represent a coherent or clearly defined building typology. A museum contains various collections, protected and displayed in different spaces. Nowadays, museums are built to attract people, to entertain and educate them. They are built as public cultural institutions as well as profitable enterprises. Museums can represent common grounds of cultures, but also may reveal cultural differences. Abu Dhabi's ambitious Sariat Island development stands for a highly ambitious, unique kind of museum island. This notion of museum island is familiar to us from the famous Berlin Museum Island, you can see here on the right side, as an ensemble of different institutions forming a global museumscape. We are developing in tandem three world-class museums that become the cone for artistic discovery, education and exchange as Mubarak Hamad al Muhari, director of the Tourism and Culture Authority in Abu Dhabi, claims to grow and develop global citizens. Quote end. Affiliated to important cultural institutions such as the Louvre in Paris and the Guggenheim in New York, the new museums of Sadiat Island also focus on themes like native tradition and nation building. With the Grand Sheikh Said National Museum by Norman Foster, Performing Arts Center by Zaha Hadid, and the not here shown Maritime Museum by Tada Rwando, Sadiat Island is poised to become the world class tourist destination within the next dec decade. By claiming the Louvre Abu Dhabi as first universal museum in the Arab world, a museum city as a world-class institution, we are immediately confronted with the globalization discourse in general and discourse on global museums in particular. We are also confronted with a crucial question like for whom are these sites built and how are these museums represented architecturally, architecturally. Even the clients of the grand project have been affected by the dramatically changed cultural and political conditions of recent time in the Middle East. Traditional cultural centers of the Arabic world, like Damascus, Baghdad, or Aleppo, have witnessed this horrified devastation, whilst ancient sites like Nimrud or Palmyra have been carelessly destroyed or under siege. Millions of people are fleeing, fleeing for their lives to neighboring countries like Lebanon, Jordan, or Turkey, while thousands of others brave the treacherous journey further afield to Europe. Large cities like Paris, Berlin, Stockholm, and London have become melting pots of cultural diversity. Not only for this reason, but in a wider post-colonial context, London, quote, one has become one of the most creative capitals, capitals of Middle East cultures, as Neil McGregor observed. It begs the question, what role Abu Dhabi with its new museum's precinct will play under these preconditions? And how, under an umbrella of an open-minded Islamic culture, the local and the global will be balanced, and how this regard, in this regard the population can benefit from this development? 
to set up a new intercultural dialogue between East and West, between Asia and Europe, America, centered and linked by Arabic culture in the Gulf, with the aim, quote, to foster a bridge to the future, to connect knowledge and civilization, and to change civilizations for the better, quote, and is an admirable and idealist, idealistic, but also highly ambitious aim. <coughs> Rather than a neighborless claim for global universalism, we first have to accept the differences between civilizations, to grapple with the disparate complexities, in short, the otherness that simultaneously both fascinates and frightens us. Art may well be a powerful vehicle to bridge the divide between cultures, but in the case of the Louvre Abu Dhabi, it will only affect surplus value compared to the Louvre in Paris when the new display focuses on the differences and the tensions between a globally paradigmatic Western culture and the status of arts or other high cultures, in particular Arabic and Islamic art. Let me give you one example, widely discussed in the recent exhibition catalogue, Making a Museum. Of the, of the Louvre in Paris uh, in regard to the Louvre Abu Dhabi. Namely, the juxtaposition of the imperial Serbian statue of an emperor or another public dignitary uh, found in the city of Rome and the Bodhisattva and the enlightened Buddha sculpture dating from the third century AD from nowadays Pakistan. Both statues are linked by the influence of Greek Hellenistic sculpture that took place under very different conditions. There is not enough time to go into detail here, but except some suggestive formal parallels, we have to consider a fundamentally different approach as public statue on the one hand and as cult figure on the other. These different meanings also depend on different functions and different usage. This step in depth and analysis is indispensable for a meaningful cross-cultural dialogue. I have mentioned these principal aspects to draw attention to the wider cultural political realm that drives museums projects today. Because the Louvre Abu Dhabi is linked globally, its spatial form is part of the globalized architectural movement and in particular part of globalized museums architecture. In the following section, I would like to focus on different layers of this globalized building typology and try to detect, detect the various different directions of development. The Louvre Abu Dhabi by Jean Nouvel, with its intricate 180 diameter flat dome creates the first landmark in Sadiat and will no doubt be an important contribution for contemporary museums architecture. By employing a monumental dome four times larger than the yeah, most ancient uh, cupola, the Roman Pantheon, Nouvel has appropriated one of the most powerful elements in architecture. The perfectly constructed dome oscillates between references to Arabic architecture and the most ambitious structural engineering project of the 20th century, for instance, by the work of Pierre-Louis Nervi and others such as the um, not so well known but very remarkable Evolon for the Philips Company in Eindhoven in the Netherlands by Leon de Bever and Louis Christian Kalf. By contrast, um, so, um, so uh, Nouvelle harks back to the to the um, to the to the most important works of uh, Pierre Luigi Nervi and others. By contrast, Nouvelle's structural design with Wagner Bureau engineers from Vienna adopts a double layer steel grillage slash shell he uses and a satellite shared digital project, a plat, uh, plat, uh, di digital project parametrically generated model as collaboration platform for both structure and cladding. Nouvelle not only emphasized the grand tradition of French engineering and dome constructions, 
but also reinterpret this traditional element as Pato's formula to use the phrase of the German cultural theorist and art historian Ebi Warburg and combines it with the vision of a future city by covering an enormous space um, as a dome as Buckminster Fuller demonstrated as early as 1964 with his spectacular project Manhattan. This novel uh, refers to the visionary side of the project. The sheer scale of the dome bring us, brings us back to the 19th century world fairs, where, for example, the Vienna Rotunda of the World Fair of 1873 displayed different pavilions and small buildings under the enormous dome. Thus, an intercultural but at the same time colonial-based dialogue was established, and uh, we can see here some of these examples for the Galerie de Machine at the Paris World Fair uh, in 1889. With its artificial sky, its translucent textures glass ceiling, the Louvre Abu Dhabi strongly evokes elements of Arabic symbolism and pattern. Nouvelle's first transformed the Corbusier Brise de Soleil in his groundbreaking 1980s Institut du Monde Arabe in Paris, but the intricate design for the Louvre employs one key notion of contemporary museum architecture, namely the metaphor of nature. The Gaudiesque representation of nature as formal and construction model is transformed into a delicate filigree structure that forms the curved skin of the dome. The illusion of a modern Orientalism through forms such as these was first utilized by Paolo Portoghese in 1974 in his central mosque in Rome, built shortly thereafter the mosque alongside the Khalid airport in Riyadh by Helmut Obata and Kassabaum also displayed similar features. So you can see here these different notions of Orientalism in postmodern architecture. The unique quality of um, Louvre's, of Nouvelle's Abu Dhabi Louvre design can be categorized as an example of an extroverted museum architecture with a combination of its grand dome Grand Dome, the human scale of the human-made archipelago constructed in the sea, and the conception of the museum as a micro-city. And you can see here once more this extraordinary construction with a double shell and this uh, combined steel aluminium construction and the different follies or pavilions uh, in this in this huge space. The formulation of the museum as a microcity can be traced back to the 19th century projects such as a Victoria and Albert Museum in London or Berlin's Museum Island. The city metaphor explicitly got on topic with the first modern museums. Examples are um, Hans Hollein's uh, museum from the Abteiberg in Mönchengladbach. Here you can see once more the actual state of the building under construction with the different follies, but I'm not quite sure, couldn't have a look at it, uh, how this exterior and interior space is really linked to each other. And uh, that's, a, that's a very interesting question, I think, and aspect of the project. And here we can see one of the first ideas of the a modern postmodern museum as a micro city. It's Hans Holland's museum in Mönchengladbach, built um, uh, until 1980. <clears throat> so, this was one of the first museums, or uh, another example would be Peter Eisenman's Wexner's Art Center in Columbus, Ohio, a bit different uh, uh, organized idea of the city with this huge main street and different pavilions, buildings um, assembled at this at the so-called main street. <clears throat> Alongside other projects such as Richard Meyer's Getty Center or uh, James Sterling's 
famous Stuttgart State Gallery, these buildings marked a new era in museum architecture, where, as Anthony Weidler claimed as early as 1981, quote, all the burden of signification lies on the architecture itself. And Rosalind Krauss assented, quote, the museum as a space from which the collection has withdrawn. Post histoire, we might then assume, so Weidler continues, would privilege the internal discourse of an architecture turned on itself, an architecture dissociated from its cultural oblig obligations, at least in so, so far as this culture has lost any secure belief in its own history. Quote end. Besides the observation, that culture in the postmodern age was divorced from the progressive paradigm of history and definitive, definite form of identity, Weidler describes a new signature architecture that broadens the scope of the museum as institution and building typology to be seen as an attractive new venue. At the same time, the new generation of museums partly distancing themselves from their educational mission. So that's a, I think that's a very crucial process which took um, place in the, around 1980. Due to the suppression of museology, arts and artists, culminating in cleansing of the so-called degenerate art in Nazi Germany, post-war museum culture saw a paradigm shift towards the United States and the establishment of two museum types that are still relevant today. Firstly, the notion of signature architecture was initiated by Frank Lloyd Wright's groundbreaking Guggenheim Museum in New York. You can see here with the first, one of the first uh, projects as early as 1943. Um, and completed in 1958 after a long planning process, the building is considered to be the, the most important piece of the collection. So that's another, uh, uh, I think, interesting um, moment when the architecture gets related or gets representative for the collection and an own piece of art. This resulted in the notion of designing a visual arresting building and using branding to connect the spatial envelope with the promoted collections. Secondly, closer to the typology of the temple, as a new pseudo-sacral pseudo container for art collections is Ludwig Mies van der Rohe's Berlin New National Gallery building, built between 1963 and 1967. Mies himself became a key figure in post-war architecture, and his museum, and especially his exhibition spaces, were highly acclaimed, particularly his famous Barcelona Pavilion. pavilion. So you can see here these both um, buildings um, which are from very different times from the 1920s and on the other hand from the 1960s. The Mesian paradigm, so to say, still remains relevant today. Rem Kohlhaas was inspired by the famous Barcelona Pavilion for the street elevation of his Rotterdam Kunsthal shortly after uh, publishing his famous uh, treatise, you could say, his famous uh, manifesto, SMLXL. So this is scale S, I would say. And um, his building manages to create a dialogue with a motorway that passes in front of it. With this pavilion scheme, the Foundation Bayerle in Basel, Switzerland, when Cipriano was inspired in particular by Misian spaces and is designed as uh, Harald Seemann um, attested, a noble and introverted architecture. Recently, Herzog and Demeron referenced Misian monumental um, Berlin ceiling in their magnificent Paris Art Museum in Miami in Florida. Here the Swiss architects and the museum is here the Swiss architects use the museum as enclosure and shelter for the microcity. 
Compared to the rational semantics of Mies, Herzog and Dümmerung addressed the sea resort location by specifying timber floors and employing, like Novell before, the metaphor of nature. A further important trend ought to be addressed briefly, a development which shattered the museum architecture in general and changed the role of this building typology in the final quarter of the 20th century. Richard Rogers and Renzo Piano's winning competition design for the Pompidou in 1971 subverted the idea of the museum. The London-based architects created a kind of non-museum, an enormous cultural machine, neither temple nor white cube. Radical for its time is the inside out of the building tore down to the uh, is the inside out building tore down to the barriers between high and low architecture. With this futuristic uh, futuristic um, high tech industrial design inspired by the visionary Archigram Group, you can see uh, one of their designs for a plug-in city um, of the 1960s and officially approved, this was a French state project, all inclusive culture seemed possible. The concept of the museum expanded to include fine arts, photography, new digital media and performing arts, as well as leisure activities like gastronomy and shopping. This development resulted in the dismissal of the traditional museum. Rather, the museum was converted and expanded to an open platform with multiple functions. Postmodernism, however, refuted this concept, arguing for specificity and a new classical architectural language. The failure of Rogers' project for the um, Sainsbury extension of the London National Gallery and the conservative choice of the architects with a very well done design uh, for the Sainsbury Wing, Venturis and Scott Brown was an unmistakable, unmistakable sign of this shift, but it was also related to the building type of the classical art museum. <clears throat> During the 1990s, another arena opened for museums. Under the auspices of a globalized art market driven by neoliberal market forces, museums started to be run like business and collections and exhibitions were judged almost exclusively for their economic feasibility. Greater attention was given to the architecture of the museum. In fact, it even became one of the key attractions of the museums themselves. And uh, you, you can see here some of these, these new approaches, for instance, in exhibitions like Let's Entertain, and here um, like um, Rem Kohlhaas uh, provocatively, uh, provocatively um, uh, figured out the idea of the expanding uh, growing economy and, uh, and the uh, share, uh, sh um, shareholder uh, values in correlation to the growth of the museum um, institutions and the growth of museum architecture. The best example for this shift in the conception of the museum coincided with the realignment of the Guggenheim under the 20-year-long directorship of Thomas Krenz, which started in <coughs> 1988. The Guggenheim expanded its sphere with affiliated worldwide, the most famous being the Guggenheim in Spain and the Guggenheim Venice, Las Vegas and Berlin. Krenz also set up international co collaborations with the Heritage Museum in St. Petersburg and the Vienna Art History Museum. Guggenheim French's strategy was criticized for its McDonaldization of culture, where the collection itself is, 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 is eclipsed by snazzy exhibition events. 
Most notably, this strategy initiated the so-called Bilbao effect, where a signature piece of architecture in combination with other large infrastructure projects managed to lift Bilbao out of its precarious economic condition. Frank Gehry's striking building made Bilbao into a cultural destination. A staggering 10 million tourists visited the city in the first decade after opening of the Guggenheim in 1997. Unfortunately, it also took a decade to incorporate Spanish and in particular Basque contemporary art into the collection in order to link the museum with, local, with the local region. It was both the attraction of the collection as well as Gay's highly sculptural architecture that represented Guggenheim's new brand. But at the same time, it became a brand for Gay himself with his characteristic computer-generated and highly complex building. So you can see here two of these um, um, after Bilbao uh, designed buildings such as the Walt Disney Concert Hall in Los Angeles or the uh, EMPF Museum in Seattle. So um, this was also a huge um, impact for Getty himself, uh, for Gary himself. A visit to the museum has become an event and part of lifestyle of an international jet set on the one hand, but also has become popularized and part of the mainstream as well as a weekend family outing. Thomas Krenz, senior advisor for the Guggenheim Abu Dhabi, which is now under planning, not under construction yet, to be realized by his old associate Frank Gay, um, maintained that the Museum of the Future should have, quote, great collections, great architecture, a great special exhibition, a great second exhibition, two, stopping oppor two shopping opportunities, two eating opportunities, a high-tech interface via internet, and economies of scale via a global network, quote, end. Nowadays, branding, event shopping, and consumerism not only take place in shopping malls or airports, but have become integral to the new generation of museums. Furthermore, the Guggenheim concept has reached the world of production and industry itself. During the last year, automobile companies such as Daimler-Benz, which is very much connected to uh, the Emirates and to Abu Dhabi in particular have commissioned ambitioned museums by famous architects like Ben van Berkel to try and uplift the sphere of car sales by using high culture. With its interior spiral uh, space, the Mercedes-Benz Museum in Stuttgart explicitly refers to the Freud's famous Guggenheim Museum. Other companies, like Volkswagen, have designed an enormous car city where, for instance, the main pavilion for Bugatti as a uh, premium clubhouse um, was shaped as a Gesamtkunstwerk, as a work of overall art installation. Here, the marriage of product and contemporary conceptual art was perfectly balanced. For this part, we can conclude that first museums have become multifunctional complexes where besides collections, multi-layered opportunities for additional cultural uh, or consumer activities are provided for. And second, museum projects have become essential for urban revitalization. So that's one of these most recent examples. Uh, at the island of uh, Tasmania, this uh, Mona, which was very much a revitalization for entire Tasmania um, as a cultural and touristic um, destination. Third, in a worst case scenario, you have a ambitious architecture, but no equivalent collection, like in the Inner Mongolian Ordos Heritage Museum. So that's, uh, that's a great gesture, gesture, but nothing in the museum. Guggenheim's success in terms of the Bilbao effect also served as model for the Centre Pompidou and the Louvre to create affiliations in Metz, Eastern France, and Lens near Lille in Northern France. 
with the Metz Pompidou by Siguru Ban, set a new um, while the Metz Pompidou by Siguru Ban set a new urban accent and reenacted the relation to the historic cityscape. The Louvre Lens can be described as an outlying project focused on Parisian visitors. Advertised as a one-day trip from Paris with only 75 minutes travel time, Louvre Lens is like an alien. It sleeks translucent forms in it sleeks translucent forms in congruously located to somewhat broken down um, minus town. Here, the Bilbao effect is unlikely to happen as the collection is too arbitrary and the link to the local site is too weak. Nevertheless, one has to acknowledge without reservation that Zana architects have designed a wonderful building that references the Mesian pavilion as well as the idea of the white cube. In contrast to the extroverted architecture by Jean Nouvel and others mentioned above, here we can speak of an introverted architecture with a counterbalancing relationship between the architectural expression and the collection. For the Sanadu, Kasui Semer and Rui Nishishava, the Louvre-Lance was a culmination of several museums' projects subsequent to, to Toledo Art Museum and the spectacular project of the Museum of Contemporary Art in New York, built, in 19, uh, 2005, built in, from 2005 to 2007, where the white cube is stacked six levels high to create an eye-catching landmark in Manhattan's Lower East Side. Japanese architects in particular seem, seem too often design introverted buildings, as can be seen with the museum building by Maki associated with the Shimano Museum Isumo Shrine in Japan and of the master architect Tadao Ando with his uh, famous Clark Art Institute and Museum in Williamstown, which was built in several slots uh, between 2004 and 2014. These architects combine space, material, and landscape into a harmonious ensemble. Some Swiss architects, like the revered architect Peter Sumtor, have also used this idea of an introverted cube with his art museum in Bregenz in Austria, completed in 90s, as early as 1997, uh, um, and he created an urban vision of an inward-looking translucent cube. Thus far, we have focused on fine art museums, but we should also consider that the, the fact that museum exhibition topics have broadened as is reflected in the large number of museum buildings that have been built in recent years. A critical acclaimed recent project um, is the Ningbo History Museum, south of Shanghai in China, by Wang Shu, where the envelope um, was built with a recycled masonry sourced from the demolished fabric of the old city. The loss of tradition and the question of identity were symbolized here with, by the architecture, and you can see um, a memorial-like approach uh, to, the, to the fabric, to the wall itself, uh, by the visitors. Another crucial topic came up around 1980 with Jewish Holocaust museums that represent a highly ideo ideologized and historical delicate topic. The representation of the unthinkable Holocaust, the representation of suffering, guilt, crime, and intolerance, as well as resistance and survival, created a new dimension for a museum that was merged with elements of the memorial. The Jewish Museum in Berlin by Daniel Liebeskind is a building steeped in, in symbolism where architecture becomes the main conveyor of meaning. In the case of Liebeskind, quote, it was an invisible matrix of connections, a connection of relationship between figures of Germans and Jews. 
quote end. And he continues by saying, I found this connection and I plotted an irrational matrix which would yield reference to the emblematic of a compressed and distorted star, the yellow star that was so frequently worn on this very side. This is the first aspect of the project, quote end. The fragmented angular shape of the building in combination with its weird spaces with irregular sloped walls and apertures created an oppressive atmosphere appropriate to the gruesome topic. The iconic Berlin building enabled Liebeskind to set up an international career comparable with Gay's breakthrough in Bilbao. But more importantly, it also demonstrated the pure power of architecture. Berlin, as a capital of both of perpetrators and victims, provides numerous historical, historically charged sites. One can regard the new museum as part of the above-mentioned museum island as one, of strike, the, uh, one striking concept that reinterpret an existed, existing but devastated building as keystone for the contemporary Berlin Universal Museum by revealing all layers of its troubled history. The process, so Shipperfield, can be described as multidisciplinary interaction between repairing, conserving, restoring, and recreating all of its components. And the British architect stated further, the very incompleteness of its decorative patterns pattern helped to create a holistic understanding of the historic and contemporary structure and its original and current purpose. Chipperfield also achieved a remarkable resonance with this project and has managed to establish himself as one of the foremost museum architects. Amongst others, he has built the well-received Anchorage Museum in Alaska, a completely different uh, project and the even more acclaimed elegant Folkwang Museum in Essen, Germany, with its marvelous modernist collection. Compared to Gay and Liebeskind, Chipperfield uses a wide range of stylistic motifs and the sober, elegant forms of recent museum contrast with the more monumental spaces of the new museum. So uh, he reconstructed parts of the new museum and you can see here the south dome uh, in the south wing of the new museum. Ming Pai um, is another architect who was also explored the concept, who also, who has also explored the concept of monumentality in his buildings. For example, he emphasized centralized spaces in his Washington Holocaust Museum. He was a very different, he, his was a very different approach from Liebeskind. Also, he addressed um, the memorial, he also, he, although he also addressed the memorial aspect. The museum is an object, job object, Pai claims. It should be treated as a piece of sculpture. His Islamic, Islamic museum in Doha, in Qatar, just neighboring here and also in an interesting competition between the different museums projects here in the region, displays this sculpture perspective. And uh, Pei also went step by step from several museum buildings for, he did before like the famous yeah, revitalization of the Louvre with this pyramid or the East Wing of the National Gallery of Washington. So uh, he, had a, he was very much experienced uh, as well with the Holocaust Museum with different topics and displaying collections in um, specific uh, spaces. Pei, in Doha, Qatar, Pei was interested in the relation between the collection and the form of the building. He analyzed the site and created an artificial island to ensure that the building remained unchallenged by the city fabric. Pai analyzed Arabic architecture in detail and traveled widely across the Middle East and the Southern Mediterranean to gain inspiration. 
Based on simple design concepts, Pi developed clear cubic form stacked in a centrifugal pattern. The centrally shaped building forms a landmark, which is reminiscent to both famous mosque complexes like Taiwan, or here's another more recent one in Casablanca, or the fortress uh, like the Castel de Monte or the famous now devastated um, citadel of Aleppo. In Doha Museum, the focus has been firmly placed on Islamic art and culture. And I come to my last point towards a critical museum. In order to reinterpret Islamic high arts as a counterpart to Western art and to demonstrate the heights of Islamic culture. Thus, the local uh, Muslim population was encouraged to claim their own legacy and to take a position in a cross-cultural dialogue. Doha's Islamic Museum, both the collection and the building, is a striking example of how globalized museums can create a new focus and have a different emphasis. The Indian cultural anthropologist Saloni Matur has criticized the superficial representation of the global that only manifests itself in a globalized architectural language. On the contrary, she suggests that Quote, a serious global approach to museums must extend its gaze beyond a mere interest in a successful exploitation of the Euro-American institution to other parts of the world and insist on a wide-ranging view of museology, museology, so museological forms, practices, and situations that would highlight different topographies of power, quote, end. Rethinking Islamic Art was the title of a recent lecture series for the Louvre Abu Dhabi here. A promises conception even for an international museum like the one on Sadiat Island. It would be wonderful if Arabic nations would raise their own voice and make a substantial contribution to the intercultural dialogue they constantly claim to be part of. Ibit Sam Abdul Aziz considered that, quote, in a certain way, a country is reflected in an art museum, such as a museum conveys something of the country's history. Of the country's history, development, and inhabitants. And for this reason, it should be open for the widest possible range of artistic approaches, even in the Emirates, quote, end. Today, Collections have become ambassadors for their local culture, and the architecture that houses the collection have become the embassies. The Louvre Abu Dhabi causes a paradox in perception, which culture serves as ambassador and who will be the beneficiary. The Louvre Abu Dhabi has a unique change to overcome this dichotomy and to pioneer new ground. Michael Foucault claimed the museum that claimed the, that museums and libraries are heterotopians in time in which time never ceases to pile up and perch on its own summit. The idea of accumulating everything, Foucault continues, the idea of constituting a sort of general archive the desire to contain all times, all ages, all forms, all tastes of one place, uh, the idea of constituting a place of all times that is itself out of time, well, in fact, all this belongs to our modernity. The museum and the, li and the library are heterotopias that are characteristic of Western culture in the 19th century. Quote end. I would assert that, that such a grand perception is no longer applicable to the deserved functions of museum and galleries today. Museums are no longer anachronistic, but rather play a central role in leisure, tourism, and modern visual culture. They are trendy and contemporary, and you see how much uh, a well recepted institution museums are in terms of, of visitors uh, with the leading institutions in Paris and London at the top. 
Museums can be incorporated into conference centers or airport, as has recently been done in the Seoul Incheon Airport. Certainly, museums can create spaces that create a counterpart to our fast-moving lifestyles. In the interaction between the displays and the spatial conception, a harmonious environment can be created where the viewer can expand their experience of beauty and its cultural and historical meaning. In this year, is an appeal to create critical museums that enlighten and stimulate people. The German uh, art historian Hans Belting characterized the museums as follows. Today, the museum does not attain signification. Uh, th today, the museum does not attain significance from being fashionable, but rather from its otherness. Difference is its current meaning. The difference is an opportunity. Thank you very much for your attention. Um, I was wondering what your opinion is on what it is about the Louvre Abu Dhabi that's going to make it a universal museum, because like the word universal isn't something that we've seen that often tied to the type of museum. And so what's going to really make it universal as opposed to global we've seen before? Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, universal is the conception of the Louvre itself in Paris. It was uh, set up as a universal museum as early as 1800 where with Dinon and the idea of really to have an all-inclusive museum, all, uh, all, all ages, all centuries, uh, all different kinds of, of, uh, of arts. And um, um, one has, I think one has to rethink this idea of the universalism in museums or other way around to, to, to ask uh, what could be the specificity of a conception which the Louvre displays um, here in Abu Dhabi. And uh, um, I don't know, I actually don't know because it's, uh, uh, we only have this, this catalog making the museum. And uh, uh, so we will see what's, what's going on uh, next year and what's uh, i think it's uh, one of the uh, one of the key points is of course to address the site here to what's where why the people should come here to to visit a louvre which is similar to the louvre in paris so but i, I think it's entirely clear for the creators and uh, i think there will be will be made some links to, to, different, to different aspects of Islamic art and uh, this, this lecture series like Rethinking Islamic Art is, I think it's, it's, a, it's a very, very good step in the right direction. Um, I have a comment and I want to get your feedback on that. Um, there are many artists who would say that what holds the painting or the frame around the painting should not overshadow the painting itself. Mm -hmm. By the same token, you cannot take a Mona Lisa and put it in a $20 IKEA frame. I think the same goes for museums. I think the building that houses the contents of a museum, to me personally, has to be as impressive. And to me, it's uh, something I look forward to, to seeing the building before I see the contents of the building. Mm -hmm. So what, what is your opinion, because that seems to be the modern trend in terms of the building itself being an artifact and something that attracts mm -hmm. the people. Mm -hmm. uh, do you think this is a lasting trend and do you uh, actually agree with this? Yeah, thank you very much for the, this question. It's not so much the, uh, my point whether I should agree with it or not. I think it's a matter of fact now. And uh, since, uh, uh, especially the Guggenheim New York with Frank Lloyd Wright, it started for our modern times, postmodern times, um, with this sort of signature architecture. And um, I think it's, it's the very interesting point is you get it immediately when you enter such a space, um, whether it fits or not, whether the, uh, the, the proof or the, the idea of, of having a grand architecture fits with a collection or fits with the inner spaces. 
and uh, uh, with a certain form of functionality. Um, so that's 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 a tricky thing. And for instance, for Nouvel, um, he was very much criticized with his museum Cambronly. Uh, I didn't mention it here. So it's an, an, it's another discussion about uh, um, displaying um, ancient, not ancient civilizations, but uh, but uh, colonial civilizations like the Oceanic and uh, the Polynes, uh, um, French uh, possessions. So how how this these ethnographic museums uh, could be could be renewed and uh, and uh, more actualized and so. Uh, there was the or is the inner space um, doesn't fit with the with the architecture. It's like a um, it's like a ghost one way you can you, you pass through and you, it's um, it's very difficult to get a point in this museum. So the, and that's the same, for instance, in the in the Holocaust Museum um, of in the Jewish Museum of Daniel Liebeskind. There's the inner collection. Um, is far apart from architecture, from the architecture. So that's that's interesting how how these things can be balanced. And other other examples are very well done, like Shipperfield, uh, as well in the New Museum, as well in the Essen Museum. It's uh, these are wonderful spaces which which are dressing the arts as well. Uh, first of all, thank you for the presentation. It was very interesting to see this whole process going on. I mean, I'm not sure if I will graduate, um, if the, the, I will see this uh, creation before I graduate, but um, I'm very curious about the Louvre Abu Dhabi. Um, my question, though, you were mentioning um, the legacy of um, countries and um, cultures, especially in the MENA region, Africa and South Asia. Uh, but what I can't wrap my head around is why does it have to be the Louvre? Why does it have to be this big brand? Why does it have to be um, replicated? So if these people um, or these governments, let's say, want to um, preserve their legacies, why does it have to go to this big brand? Um, and do you think, what, what would you say about the argument that a creation like Louvre Abu Dhabi or the Copenhagen and other cities is an attempt to avoid um, certain countries and cultures um, of reclaiming their own legacies from these big uh, colonial uh, institutions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. That's also a very complex, uh, complex uh, question, and thank you very much. It's, uh, but uh, I also again can't answer only parts of it because the, the conception to get world-class museums in it's like to get world-class uh, educational institutions like certain universities here, NYU, and so on. I think that's that's a that's a business model of of Abu Dhabi, um, to to also to guarantee a certain sort of quality. And on the other hand, one can ask, okay, why is this necessary? Why we can't set up or why can't set up the Emirates or Abu Dhabi? Uh, why can't they set up? for themselves a museum institution. And that's about also foreign politics. And I think it's, uh, it's very much um, uh, for, for such a huge museum like the Louvre, it's, it's easily possible to um, take some of its high class collection and to, to, to send it uh, to a place like Abu Dhabi. That's from the sheer mass of, of objects that's possible. So uh, otherwise, you, how could you collect or could you set up such a collection? That's, it's very difficult today. On the other hand, um, this was the model of um, the Guggenheim. The Guggenheim had su such a big collection that they uh, only could present 10, 20% of its collection. So they, they were really keen to present their entire collection. But um, this was also very much criticized that the collection hadn't this a certain level. Um, so Bilbao, that wasn't not interesting for the collection. 
uh, but interesting <laughs> because of the architecture. So um, I think here here comes both together. I hope, hopefully, I think so with the, with the Louvre Abu Dhabi, and uh, yeah. So that's uh, that's the idea. But to the other point would be how to get impact from here. So that's that's the other point I addressed earlier. So. Just, just following on from that, I remember a few years ago there was an NYU conference and one of the speakers was an Indian anthropologist and she said ordinary people are frightened to go into iconic buildings and that we should have museums that don't have buildings, that a, a museum for me, and I'm an archaeologist, a researcher, mm -hmm. for me the most important thing is the collections itself and the chance to be able to research and study those collections. Mm -hmm. Display is one aspect, but it's something that is not talked often about with museums. And I remember this anthropologist said there is only one good museum in all the UAE. And everyone was thinking, what is she going to say? And she said, Ibn Battuta Mal, because Ibn Battuta Mal has some of the places that Ibn Battuta traveled to, represented in the Mal, you see some of the objects, and actually they have an actor dressed as Ibn Battuta walking around, so you can even talk with Ibn Battuta. But it was interesting, that aspect of, um, she was saying, reverting the museum concept. You know, a museum is not uh, just a building. Um, a museum is actually the collection and the people mm -hmm. and the researchers mm -hmm. um, um, within mm -hmm. it, and I think that's a very important point. And secondly, um, just in reverting museums, um, something no one is talking about private museums. Everyone is talking about star architects, about big museums and things. But the most interesting thing in Arabia, for me, are the private collectors and private museums. Mm -hmm. And no one is discussing these. And they have their own methodology and typology and way they organize these museums. And in Saudi Arabia, I've seen some fascinating collections, and they are organized in a completely different manner to all the conventional museums mm. that are being planned here. So I, I would say advocate the ordinary people by mm. inverting the, the concept of having to have a building for a museum and, and also consider this private museum aspect and, and do talk and think about it because there's too much concentration on these big uh, projects. Mm -hmm. No, thank you very much. It's, uh, I would be curious to, to look at such uh, collections you, men you have mentioned in Saudi Arabia or so. But, but I think that's the, the one point is, uh, is, the, is the research and uh, the other point is uh, the educational aspect of museum. And that's, um, that's, that's a point that I'm missing a bit uh, in the entire debate. Uh, museums should be educational institutions. And should should address, and there is a wonderful, uh, long-lasting tradition. For instance, the V&A, um, which which uh, set up as early as 1860, um, um, long-lasting opening hours uh, until for workers, addressed workers, and and had uh, um, lectures and so on. So for these for these specific. Um, um, classes uh, in, in society. So that's, that's, uh, that's important, I think, also for the, for the huge museums, uh, for the big, big names, uh, to, to do so, to, to continue uh, in places like here. Um, to continue the, uh, the last points, uh, if museums uh, would, em again, emphasize a function or their traditional function as institutions for education, which not all, certainly not contemporary art museums would agree to, but let's assume that that um, is indeed their task, and I think that probably is their task of these museums here in Abu Dhabi. The question then is, um, what are they going to educate mm -hmm. in view of globalization? Yeah. Are they going to advocate globalization? Are they going to critique it? Are they going to, how are the two, how can one imagine that they two can be married? On the one hand, the educational task of the museum, on the other hand, the, the ideal of globalization. Mm -hmm. Yeah, as I said, it's, uh, I think it's, it's also very crucial. It's, uh, this uh, globalization paradigm also means that we have to look at these differences. And I think the, uh, under current political conditions, 
the voice of the Arabic world is important, I think, and to, to bridge um, also the cultures between East and West, and it's, it's a very important geostrategical place here, and uh, and so that that could be one one uh, contribution um, in the entire debate of globalization. So. Uh, what's what's the position of Arabic culture um, in this in this globalized field? Does it exist anymore? And uh, how how will it how will it uh, continue proceed? So that's um, yeah, could be one answer. Yeah. So the, so the uh, the educational task of a museum <coughs> that aspires to be global in its collection mm -hmm. and global in its outreach, global in the audience that it uh, attracts. That museum can be extremely local, so to speak, mm -hmm. uh, in the way it addresses yeah. that very question. Yeah, of course. Yeah, and I think it's it's a, it's a lot of work to do to to explain how uh, like such such uh, canvases uh, of medieval art and in Christian uh, cult uh, relations how these were manufactured and uh, and. Uh, received and and what does it mean uh, with Orientalist painting of the 19th century and uh, the representation of the human uh, body and so on. So uh, there are lots and lots of uh, things which are very specific uh, in addressing uh, Arabic people, I think. I'm, but I'm not an Arabist, <laughs> I have to say. 